there's a certain assumption that a modern audience has when we hear the phrase housewife. There's a stereotype of frustrated women who are forced to stay at home all day, completing endless thankless task after thankless task, frustrated, sexually repressed, overwhelmingly bored and miserable with her life. The housewife of pop culture has a husband who is both cruel and neglectful, children that are props for a lifestyle she doesn't really want, and she spends most of her day on her own, with perhaps a radio or television as her only outlet into a wider world that she has no means to access. While there is plenty to deconstruct in our modern perception of the housewife, a lot of the ideas that we hold come from an 18th and 19th century perception of how wealthy or middle class women should spend their time. The 18th and 19th century vision of femininity seemed to stress that women could not and should not behave, act or do certain things. There is an idea, somewhat based on reality, that women of the higher classes did little in the home beyond visiting others, like reading, embroidery, ignoring their children and generally going crazy from boredom, which was a real thing that did happen to women and was pretty horrifying. But the housewife of ages past had perhaps a better life than you might immediately assume. While the Victorian housewife might consider herself to live in an enlightened age better than the women who came before her, housewives of the 16th century were more practical, educated and sociable than she or you might imagine. So this video, essay, lecture, information dump, is dedicated to those women who lived in a time of rapidly changing gender politics in an England dominated by female authority figures. What was it like being a desperate Tudor housewife? Part 1. Marriage is what brings us together. When people picture a marriage taking place in 16th century England, most of us would imagine that every marriage was an arranged match, that the couples were very young, and that society was strictly made up of married couples who preached against premarital sex. The reality of Tudor marriage was much more complicated. Records taken after the 1753 Marriage Act would suggest that around 20% of people just didn't get married, whether they were queer, trans, didn't really like the institution of marriage, whatever. And a third of brides went down the aisle pregnant. Church records of the 16th century tell us that the average Tudor couple got married at a similar age to couples now. The US Census Bureau records that a couple in 2018 would get married at an average 29 years for men and 27 for women. A Tudor couple was aged around 26 for women and between 27 and 29 for men. Setting up a home was expensive and time consuming, so most Tudor couples would work and spend time saving their money before getting married. Only the very richest and most powerful got married at the super young ages we seem to associate with Tudor brides, and a grown man who chased only after young teenage girls was seen as being a little weird. It was distasteful to marry a young girl to a much older man. I must needs confess that to match a young maid with an old man, it is miserable. Most young girls would go more willingly to their graves. However, it is true that most marriages were suggested by parents and elders. Marriage for the rich, the well-connected, anyone with a bit of money, was a business arrangement. And even for your average shooter housewife, a marriage meant two families connecting and forming a permanent relationship. In a world where connection and societal kudos could have severe ramifications on your future economic prosperity and happiness, a marriage was something to be seriously considered and might require formal arranging. Women were brought up to be obedient and to fulfil familial duties. But don't assume that this automatically means that marriages were cold, loveless and an act that women were forced into. For a start, forcing a child into a marriage where they would be actively unhappy or abused was seen as fundamentally unkind. The 16th century equivalent of a dick move. It also brought the holy state of matrimony into disrepute. Whether your family was Catholic or Protestant, the state of marriage was given by God for a holy purpose and parents would have their children marry people they could actually like and get along with. All the perfections of the world cannot force love and where the fancy delighteth, many defects are perfected or tolerated. 
says George Watson in A Heptameron of Civil Discourses, which is a 1582 text that covers advice for a happy marriage. While the Tudor ideal of love was different than our own modern ideas on love, in that they distrusted mad, passionate love as being too emotional and not being able to last, they did believe that compatibility and compassion for your partner was a vital aspect of a marriage. The greatest joy and sweetest comfort that a man may have in this world is a loving, kind and honest wife. Till death do you part was the actual rule of the day, and parents and partners did seek out those they could get on with for the rest of their lives. This can be seen, in example, in betrothal agreements of the time. Take the contract between Thomas Rokes and Thomas Strainer in 1466, who agreed upon a marriage between two of their children. But the agreement would be null and void if the children disagreed or disliked each other. Tell Troth's New Year's gift is a text that advises parents who sought to matchmake couples. The first course is a constrained love when as parents do by compulsion couple two bodies, neither respecting the joining of their hearts, nor having any care of the continuance of their welfare, but more regarding the linkage of wealth and money together than of love with honesty, will force affection without liking and cause love with jealousy. For either they marry their children in their infancy when they're not able to know what love is, or else match them with inequality, joining burning summer with key cold winter, their daughters of twenty years old or under with rich cormorants of threescore or upwards, whereby either the dislike that grows with years of discretion engendereth disloyalty in the one, or the knowledge of the other disability leads him to jealousy. So, as a woman became a wife, we can hope that her parents listened to advice and had made a match or allowed her to make a match that would make her happy. It's nearly impossible to judge the happiness of a Tudor bride based on our own modern perspective, as women were kind of brought up to be wives and to expect that, and there would have been unhappy marriages. But we must expect that there were very, very happy marriages as well. Once the marriage ceremony is done and the marriage is locked in place with consummation and before you know it, there's a child in the cradle, what's next? For the Tudor housewife. Part two. Education. Education was in the midst of a revolution during the 16th century. The advent of the printing press and the humanist school of thought had changed the relationship between the wider public and literacy in a remarkable way. Simply put, more and more people had a wider access to the printed word. So how did this impact on the Tudor housewife? Well, the education of children up to the age of seven was seen as the responsibility of their mothers, so it was seen as increasingly necessary by some that women needed to have an academic education. Thomas Beckham in The Catechism of 1559 argues for equal opportunity schooling for young girls. Is not the woman the creature of God so well as the man? Is not the woman a necessary member of the commonweal? Have not we all our beginning of her? Are we not born, nursed and brought up of a woman? Do not the children for the most part prove even such as the mothers are of whom they come? Can the mothers bring up the children virtuously when they themselves be void of all virtue? Can the nurses instil any goodness into the tender breasts of their nurse children when they themselves have learned none? Can that woman govern a house godly which knoweth not one point of godliness? To put it in a more snappy, modern way, Women were the first religious educator of children, and with religious belief and knowledge of God being key in the life of any 16th century person, he's basically saying that women needed to be formally educated to best teach their own children. And certainly, there were some women of the highest classes who were certainly educated to be the intellectual equals of men. Margaret Moore, Lady Jane Grey, Catherine Parr, the Cook sisters, and even Elizabeth I, with a number of these women even publishing their own works on theological thought. However, it's not quite the full picture, certainly for your average Tudor housewife. Thomas Beckham's ideas were certainly not the standard across England, and the idea of education was different than the view we have now. We see education as being interchangeable with academics, and that was not the case in the 16th century. Education was seen as a valuable asset for women, but the educated Tudor housewife was one who was capable of looking after her home, her household and her family properly. Sure, Elizabeth I could speak eight languages, but do you really want her to bake you a fruit tart? 
A housewife needed to have the skills to see a family fed, clothed and kept in good health. Gervais Markham's The English Housewife cites the skills needed by a housewife. Skill in physic, cookery, banqueting stuff, distillation, perfumes, wool, hemp, flax, dairies, brewing, baking and all other things belonging to a household. Such as poultry, animal rearing, keeping bees, investment in business, entertaining guests. Educated as a description is relative. Both the anonymous Tudor housewife, who could do all the skills of Markham's ideal woman, and Lady Jane Grey, were both highly educated and intelligent women. But their skills were drastically different from each other. We only perceive Tudor women being uneducated as compared to our own ideas of what to be educated means, and because of historians who, collectively over centuries, undervalued the abilities of women as compared to those of the men around them. Just because a Tudor housewife couldn't speak Greek or debate Cicero's ideas of republic didn't mean that she hadn't received an education. Her education was one suited to her position and role in society. And if we're going to get into the idea of academic education as having an intrinsic value over a practical education, let's have a quick aside into rates of literacy amongst women in the 16th century. Court records of the 1580s to 1640s compiled by David Cressy suggests that 90% of women in London couldn't write, and 95% of other women in England couldn't write either. However, how we view literacy is different than Tudor literacy. We see someone as being literate if they can both read and write, but consider that many people in the Tudor period were functionally literate, so they could read or write based dependent on their needs. The wide variety of books and pamphlets on behaviour, needlework, dancing, music, housekeeping, marriage guidance suggests that there was a significant amount of women who were able to access and read them. If a Tudor housewife needed help on how to make better cheese or what her children should learn, there would be a selection of the population that could just pick up a book and find out. Tudor women couldn't become doctors, lawyers or elected politicians but they were still very educated and highly knowledgeable. Part 3. Ass work. Ruth Goodman, in her fantastic work House of the Tudor, starts her chapter on women's work with a summary of just about how much work a woman might be expected to do, as stated in John Fitzherbert's Book of Husbandry in 1523. A woman's work day began with sweeping the house, tidying the dishboard and milking the cows, checking on the calves and pouring the morning's new milk through a series of clean cloths to ensure that no dirt or cow hair remained within it. Then she was to get the children up and dressed and make the breakfast. Later in the day she was to prepare both dinner and supper, bake bread and brew ale, make butter and cheese, feed the poultry and pigs twice a day, gather eggs, do the gardening, prepare hemp and flax and spin it, comb and spin wool from the sheep, winnow wheat, do the laundry, make hay, take corn to and from the mill, sell her butter, eggs and cheese at market, do the family shopping, turn barley into malt, make the family's underwear, she was also to help her husband in filling the muck wagon, driving the plough and shearing the corn. As he himself admits, Thou shalt have so many things to do, that thou shalt not well know where is best to begin. These tasks were the day-to-day -day reality for many women across England, both urban and rural. A woman's work was considered to be less reliant on physical strength, although I imagine doing all that took a lot of physical strength, and it had to be done regardless of any other commitments, like say being pregnant all the time, or looking after your children. The sheer amount of daily work that a housewife had to do seems beyond ridiculous, impossible even, especially considering how even the most simple task was made much more complicated by the time in which they lived. So take clearing up a spill on the floor. Y your kids drop their bottle. It seems simple on the face of it, until you remember the majority of floors in a Tudor home were earth, so you've got to sweep up from the soil, scrub the soil clean with no modern cleaning agents. A Tudor housewife had to be pharmacist, chemist and scientist to even begin getting their home clean on a daily basis. Take vermin for example. A huge problem without modern chemical agents. How best to get rid of the fleas that your dog keeps bringing into the house? Le Menage de Paris, the Goodman of Paris, there's no fewer than six different ways to get rid of fleas. From strewing wormwood, which you have to pick and prepare, drying ferns and hanging them up in bunches, or 
making your own glue to spread on bread that the fleas will hopefully stick to. Or maybe your home doesn't have a problem with rats, it's got a problem with fleas. The Goodman first advises that you have a good array of cats. Looks like we've got a comedian here. And then he gives a recipe for a multiple rat poison made from arsenic, aconite and pig fat that should be shaped into cakes and nailed to the floor, all without accidentally poisoning yourself, your kids or anyone else in the house. Remember that your laundress pains is great when labours only keep you sweet and neat. By her thy linen sweet and cleanly dressed, else thou would stink above ground like a beast. These lines come from John Taylor's poem in praise of clean linen, which highlights one of the major jobs that a housewife would handle. Laundry was a huge undertaking. Undershirts and linens were the key way in which Tudors kept themselves clean and hygienic. So doing laundry properly was serious business, and you can't just bung a dirty shirt into a washing machine. Doing laundry required a great deal of work and knowledge. Sheets, large linens and tablecloths had to be pre-soaked before laundry day in a large tub. This is a process called bucking, and to get this right, you had to be in the know. The dirty washing had to be folded and prepared inside the tub in a very certain way. So as you pour the water, it runs through the linen and soaks it, but when the water gets dirty, it won't leave marks on the material where it sits. You get that? I couldn't do it. Once your laundry is soaked, you'll then need to use a soap. Oh, have you remembered to make your soap? You could buy it, but the thrifty housewife makes it at home. You could create lay, a strong alkaline solution for pouring directly onto your clothes from wood ashes or fern ashes, so stuff you can just get quite easily. You also might want to create bar soap by boiling up animal fat with lye. A pretty dangerous process when not done properly because lye will give you serious chemical burns and permanent scarring if you're not sensible. That doesn't even get into the issue of bleach, which is a necessity to get your whites whiter than white and is made from fermented human urine. So, the clothes are wet. You soap them and soap them and you've managed not to drown. Uh, that's not a joke. You might think that childbirth is the most common cause of death for women over the course of history, but during this time, housework is the leading cause of death. Either you've got your, your skirt caught up in a fire and you've burnt to death, or as you are out doing laundry, soaking your sheets, your dress has got saturated and you drown because you're wearing like five layers of clothing and you're ridiculously heavy and you just sink to the bottom. Pretty grim. The art of Tudor cleaning, anyway, comes from not using soap and soaking, but by beating. A woman doing laundry would use bats to force dirt molecules out of the fabric by force. Provided, of course, that the housewife is only washing plain linen without embroidered decoration or made from a complicated fabric like wool or velvet. These would require a more gentle treatment such as being boiled in warm urine or being brushed out to remove dirt or detritus. Fur, worn by some lucky individuals, required being beaten in dry weather to remove dirt and then you've got clothes coloured with non colour fuss dyes would require gentle hand cleaning with homemade detergents made from plants like soapwort. Just wanting to wash a, a small load of a bed sheet, a shirt with embroidery, a child's smock coloured with dye would require specific knowledge of a wide array of different processes and skills simply to just get clean washing at the end. Making chemical agents, making bleach, keeping dye intact, cleaning different cloth types, all while managing and maintaining a clean home, watching your children and cooking meals for an entire household. And talking of cookery, part four, cookery. To speak then of the outward and active knowledges which belong to our English housewife, I hold the first and most principal to be a perfect skill and knowledge in cookery, together with all the secrets belonging to the same, because it is a duty really belonging to a woman, and she that is utterly ignorant therein may not be the laws of strict justice challenge the freedom of marriage, because indeed she can then but perform half her vow, for that she may love and obey, 
but she cannot serve and keep him with that true duty which is ever expected. These are the words of Gervais Markham in The English Housewife, laying out his case that a woman who could not cook was one that had broken her marriage vows. A housewife's skill in the kitchen was a point of pride amongst her societal peers, even amongst the highest born in the country. Elena Poole, Lady Fetterplace, published her recipe book, and she took a personal hand in the cooking in her homes. Her recipe books were written by herself, and she changed and annotated them frequently. Two or three spoonfuls of water is changed in one recipe to four spoonfuls, while another recipe recommends that a dull sauce can be improved when you must put some wit one in the gravy with the vinegar. Her recipe book is one of the earliest of a kind and shows the importance of cookery to the social standing of the housewife. For a lot of the population, a meal came down to simple things like bread and pottage. Or at least, simple on paper. A pottage or stew can be set to cook in a cauldron over a fire and left to just its own devices while you do other things around the home. Presuming, of course, that you have a fire to cook on. Fuel for a fire costs money, and urban apartments in the new bustling city lives of London and Norwich, they didn't come with inbuilt cooking areas. Instead, those homes would rely on what could be prepared based on takeaway foods. You'd also need to know how to build and keep a boiling fire going, because a boiling fire is different than, say, a roasting fire. And bread. Bread is the stuff of life, your daily meal, the substance that makes up a majority of a person's calorific intake over the day. An average Tudor would have eaten between two and five pounds of bread a day, which is a bit like sitting down and eating over 120 slices of bread. Most of this bread would have been produced at home, because buying it in every day would have been pretty expensive. The flour would have to be bought, as trade lords banned hand milling of grains at home in 1500. So once you've made your dough, kneaded it, and it was advised you do that with your feet rather than wear out your arms, let it prove, you'll then need to bake it, provided your oven's at the right temperature, and that your home has a dedicated bread oven. If not, you'll need to go to town to the communal bread oven and hire it to bake your bread, spending hours of your day, every day, just to get a basic food stuff. Cooking was labour intensive on every level, and even boiling a joint of meat required hours of work. Rise up the social ladder, and work in the kitchen just gets harder. Those of the middling sorts not only had to get the best food items, but had to know what to get for what situation. Meat, fish, game? How to cook it? Is it best boiled, or poached, or roasted? What goes best with what cut of meat? What sauce should be served? You would also need to know how to store it and preserve it, how to present it elegantly for a meal. A good display at mealtime is essential to the social standing of a household, and even a basic feast would take days of work. This doesn't even begin to cover the more detailed or specialised work a housewife might have to do in the kitchen. Devised paste, or confectionery work, was done by the housewife rather than her servants, as refined sugar priced at 22 pence a pound is too expensive for servants to be around. In case they fill their pockets with sugar and smuggle it out to the sugar black market to make their fortune. Fondant is still a difficult skill to master. Uh, I have never been, <laughs> I'm terrible at making icing and fondants. Can't do it to save my life. That's not even accounting for the skills to shape it, colour it and bake it without the help of you know, oven guides or specific oven temperatures. A housewife might choose to also make her own dairy products. Another process that could easily go wrong if not done specifically perfectly. A dairy and the goods used to process raw milk into butter, cream and cheese must be kept spotless and germ free. Household management guides advise cleaning and scalding tools and room at least once a day, as well as using sunlight to bleach the tools with UV light. And that doesn't even begin to get into the hard labour of say, churning butter for hours or preparing butter to keep throughout the year by working salt through it with your bare hands. After all that, you think the housewife might be able to sit back and enjoy herself a quiet drink. Eh, uh, that's another task you'll have to do by hand. With water too dangerous to drink, milk not available for most of the year and reserved for either the very young or the very old, you'll need to brew some beer or ale. So you'll need to know how to malt barley. Be able to harvest yeast from the air or to buy it in and keep it alive and know how to get it to ferment properly. 
all that just to enjoy a bit of beer in the evening. Part five, medicine. Doctor, doctor. An act, 1512, put into law that nobody in England should practice physic or surgery except graduates of Oxford or Cambridge unless licensed by the bishop of the diocese. The act was aimed at common artificers as smiths, weavers and women that boldly and customarily take upon them great cures and things of great difficulty in which they partly use sorcery and witchcraft to the grievous hurt, damage and destruction of the king's liege people. Women were singled out as they were central in Tudor medicine. They were the people responsible for the comfort and well-being of the family, with professional medical help being cost prohibitive or just not that accessible. Housewives were expected to deal with nearly all medical problems, from headaches and chickenpox to broken bones and the plague. They just had to be able to cope, and were often responsible for nursing elderly relatives. People got ill often and for longer, so nursing and preparing medical treatments would have taken up a considerable proportion of a woman's time in the home. They would use early pharmaceutical remedies, using herbs that had to be kept throughout the year in some way, with a housewife needing to be able to prepare and recognise salves, syrups, candies and sweet waters. Which all sound kind of the same, but they're actually all different things. A housewife's medical knowledge was both feared and respected by society, with famous cunning women being very well known as witches, and at risk of official reprimands, or being praised, such as the ringing praise of 16th century celebrity Dr Paracelsus, who claimed that he learnt all he knew from witches. A respectable housewife who valued her own talents would have little faith and no use for professional doctors, as in the case of Marjorie Paston, whose husband wrote to her, Mistress Marjorie, I recommend me to you, and I pray you in all haste possible to send me by the next sure messenger that you can get me a large poultice of your flower of ointments for the king's attorney, James Hobart, for his disease is but an ache in the knee. He is the man who brought you and I together, and I would give forty pounds that you could with your plaster part him from his pain. But when you send me the poultice, you must send me writing how it should be laid to and taken from his knee and how long it should abide on his knee without removal, and how long the plaster will last, and whether or not he must wrap any more clothes about the plaster to keep it warm. And God be with you. Part 6. 9 to 5. The business world. With daily life already full of mundane tasks required to maintain some sort of family order and survival through yet another day, you'd think that Tudor housewives wouldn't have time to do much of anything else. You would be wrong. Women were societally expected to be humble and submissive, yet the work of many historians has consistently shown that many women played an active and full part in business life. The act of finishing household tasks often produced surplus goods, say, extra butter. All women worked to produce goods for sale. Their efforts were often necessary for a household's economy. Spinning, for example, was a task that many women undertook to earn extra coin. So much so that the term spinster became removed from the job and nearly entirely associated with the women who worked like that, who were not necessarily single. Repairs to clothing, done as part of household tasks or laundry, could be turned into neighbourhood businesses, with women working from home or selling goods door to door. And that's just the women who didn't work full time. Only five out of the 500 trade guilds in England excluded women. While most women married into guilds, so taking on a husband's business if widowed and running it independently after assisting and working in the background, some women joined guilds based on their own merits. Girls could join a trade as an apprentice, like a boy, with some girls even being apprenticed into male trades, such as 1534's Alice May, who joined the household of Thomas White to learn to become a pinner, so someone who makes pins. Married women could be legally registered as a femme sole and be held responsible for their own debts, remarkable in a legal system where a woman's property was automatically that of her husband's. These housewives could rent houses or shops without any involvement from their husbands, as well as keep apprentices and enter legal contracts for goods and services. The list of free citizens of Salisbury in 1612 included women trading alone as merchants, tanners, butchers, pewterers, running inns, working as tailors, glovers and maltsters. They could reach the lofty heights of Catherine Fenkel, who worked as an independent trader of drapery goods 
lived in a luxurious London mansion and was a key social figure in the Draper's Company. All the famous London silk women, such as Alice Claver, who produced goods for the royal family and whose business was entirely her own. Even while working for husbands, housewives in business worked as middlemen as traders, made crafts with a technical know-how while balancing accounts and handling clients, and presented the public face of a business at guild feasts and public events. A head for business was a useful asset for the Tudor housewife, exploiting a change in the public perception of the role of women during the 16th century. There were also jobs that were carried out exclusively by women. Laundresses and washerwomen were employed at larger and prestigious households, could earn a significant wage. A washerwoman can know a great deal about the goings on of a family and it's wise to keep them well paid. Wet nursing was a job that only women could do and working as a rocker or a nursemaid for a well-connected family could bring significant benefit in the future. Charges could become very attached to their wet nurses. One particular example being Anne Oxenbridge, wet nurse to none other than Henry VIII. Not only did she receive a generous pension of £20 a year, but she was specially invited to his coronation in 1509. And of course, there is midwifery. Midwives were licensed by the diocese as they were in a position to baptise children, and it was a respected and well-paid job that only women could hold. I'm hoping to do more in Tudor midwifery in the future on this channel, as the history of midwifery and the changes from midwives to doctors is pretty fascinating. Women in work during this time period isn't obviously a completely sunny picture. The majority of women who worked did so in service and were considerably lower paid than their male counterparts and often subjected to frequent acts of male violence. In Bristol over the period of 1552 to 65, there were only 36 female apprentices as opposed to 1,571 male apprentices, a difference of 97%. A woman's money became her husband's property. And many housewives worked not for the pleasure of working for herself and running a business, but because the pennies they could earn spinning or washing the neighbour's clothes were the difference between keeping just above the poverty line. Others had no choice but to join the gruelling work of their husbands in fields of paid seasonal labour, while some wandered the country endlessly in the prospect of some work. In Cornwall, poor women would dig for lugworms to sell as bait for fishermen. In the Fens, housewives might earn pennies from doctors by wading half-naked into, into Fenland water to catch leeches. The difference between comfort and home and food in the belly to homelessness and starving to death outside was often marginal. And no matter how they earned an income, a Tudor woman's marital status was how society defined them, not by any independent work or trade they might do. A lot of this work, either business or household work, was part of a system that kept women confined in the home. Part 7. A religious life. A wife, above all things, to be of upright and sincere religion, and in the same both zealous and constant, giving by her example an incitement and spur unto all her family to pursue the same steps and to utter forth by the instruction of her like those virtuous fruits of good living, which shall be pleasing both to God and his creatures. Thought Gervais Markham. Religion was a fundamental aspect of Tudor life in a way that cannot be comprehended today by many of us. From how children were educated, to how money was controlled and spent, how authority was viewed, Religious thought dictated a considerable amount of an individual person's life and was perhaps the overriding concern of the 16th century. The century was dominated by questions about religion and the role it played in everyday life. Catholic or Protestant? Vernacular Bible or Latin Bible? Baptism in childhood or baptism in adulthood? Icons in your church or completely plain? Salvation through faith or salvation through good deeds? Transubstantiation or... Opposite transubstantiation! Religion was a vital and dividing, ongoing argument that was a source of passion and often violence. Women in the 16th century did not have official church positions. They weren't even allowed to just sit freely in church wherever they wanted. Seating in churches was divided along gender lines, with women assigned to the seating in the north which was poorer, you know, less of a good view of the preacher, than other seating. Women were to be quiet and humble and not express their opinions openly in public and obviously women 
always conform to these ideas all the time. That's why Marjorie Hopkins and Barbara Nichols were screaming at each other in church about how the other one was a whore and a bastard in the middle of the church. Or why Anne Cripps and Margaret Smythe actually had a full-on fistfight in the middle of a church over pews that the archdeacon was unable to stop. A woman's voice was often considered to be the authority on religious matters in the home. A mother or a grandmother was often credited with introducing a person to religious ideas and teaching them their first prayers often learning their letters with a horn book that would show the Lord's Prayer, and it was natural that a woman should teach her children to follow the Christian beliefs that she valued. A housewife was the organiser of the home, and she would instruct her household with which religious ideas to follow. It was seen as important for a housewife to look after the physical and spiritual health of her children and her servants, so saving their souls for Catholicism or Protestantism would be vitally important to the Tudor housewife. They also kept themselves informed of changes and doctrinal thoughts and challenged teachings or beliefs that they thought were wrong. 51 women questioned for their religious beliefs in November 1576 were able to express doubt or support for the complex doctrinal issues of the day, with many of them extremely well versed in philosophical discussions on transubstantiation, and they weren't shy about expressing what they agreed with or what they thought was wrong. It was often easy for women to question religious law and to get away with it during the official term religious mess of Tudor England. Housewives were in a position to circumvent the law and openly defy authorities. They could hide icons or religious texts in their homes. They, they hid recusants and forbidden preachers. They could refuse to attend church or harass those who they felt did not conform to the religious ideas that they valued. After all, as a married woman... You own no property. All your property belongs by default to your husband. So breaking the law on religion, like re refusing to attend an Anglican service or be an open Catholic, could result in very little real punishment. Being given a fine or a threat to confiscate your property doesn't work as a punishment when legally you don't own a single goddamn thing. Tudor women used the laws that invalidated their role in society to get away with openly defying the law. And Tudor women could be incredibly voracious about the religious beliefs. And even with the legal loopholes that they exploited, they could face real serious punishment. Fox's Books of Martyrs, which does have issues with reliability, recounted plenty of stories of early Protestant women who fought and died to promote their beliefs. They did amazing things, often with communities of other women. Alice Collins, wife of Richard Collins, memorised the entire Bible and other religious texts so that she could recite them for those who couldn't read but wished to study them. Elizabeth Young illegally brought translated forbidden religious texts from France to distribute them in London. Anne Askew supported a network of religious women, demanded a divorce, wrote religious poetry, preached openly under her maiden name and was tortured and executed. On the other side, Margaret Clitheroe refused to attend Anglican services, sent her son to be a Catholic priest, hid priests in her home before being arrested, refusing to give a plea and being crushed to death underneath her own door. Although what's remarkable about Margaret Clitheroe is that her husband was a Protestant and was just like, right, if you believe that passionately, I'm not going to do a thing to stop you. The sheer number of women detained, questioned, punished or martyred shows that housewives played an active and intrinsic role in furthering religious ideas despite the political and societal limitations placed upon them. They were supposed to be submissive and obedient, but we can clearly see that they were happy to argue and express themselves clearly. Part 8. Punishment. And not fun punishment, but like full-on deterrent punishment. Any discussion of marriage or being a housewife in the 16th century would be remiss in not mentioning punishment. Beating your wife was permitted by law. While a housewife owned, controlled, had full authority in a household, the husband had ultimate authority over his wife and was allowed to use physical force to control or discipline his wife. It's hard to judge how common domestic violence was. It was incredibly widely accepted. It was socially acceptable to beat your wife. I mean, you were advised to not do it too hard, but 
there was nothing really stopping a husband from using physical force to correct his wife. Overly vocal women were also perceived as subversive threats to the community, and those who were seen as disturbing the peace, so, you know, being a nag, shouting, swearing, gossiping. Women who did such wicked acts were subject to corrective punishments held in her community. This is where you get the scold's brank and the ducking stool, tools used to humiliate women in public for going against the mould, parading them through their communities to be jeered at and chastised by their friends, relatives and neighbours. Again, it's hard to judge how common, the, how common these measures were, but considering how well known the scold's bridle and the ducking stool are in modern culture, would suggest that their prospective use was commonly known as a deterrent to questionable women. Part 9. Uh, conclusion? It's hard to judge the satisfaction or personal happiness of people who lived 500 years ago, according to our standards, because the frameworks for how we judge those feelings are incredibly different. Looking at a Tudor housewife's lot, I don't think I'd be personally happy with that life, based on my modern brain. But from the records left, it seemed that Tudor housewives seemed to feel personal satisfaction in their lives and the roles they played. The people of Tudor England lived in a world marked by patriarchal inequality. Their social work had a strict hierarchy, one that continued in the home. The husband was in control of the household. He was a father to those all inside his home. Servants, staff, his close family, his wife. Women were considered inferior to men less physically strong, less intellectually rigorous, having less legal standing, less protection. They were cold and wet in humour compared to the hot and dry nature of men. An ideal wife was chaste, humble, meek and obedient. And yet this view of women as being totally inferior and meek and just letting men run their world entirely is false. Silent and retiring women who cannot push themselves forwards don't organise yearly incomes, they don't manage a household, they don't order in crossbows, manage successful businesses and argue and barter with men in the way that Tudor housewives did. Consider Thomas Tusser's 500th points of good husbandry, which offered guidance to maintaining a good household. A hundredth good points of husbandry, maintaineth good household with huswifery, Housekeeping and husbandry, if it be good, must love one another like cousins in blood. A husband was, in the household hierarchy, above his wife. However, a husband and wife should be companions, working together for goals. They should work together to manage a home and maintain a household. And a husband should respect, trust and go forth in life with the advice and approval of his wife. It was not considered usual or appropriate for a husband to rule his home and his wife with an iron fist and keep his family in fear. For a world marked by female inequality, a housewife was expected to have respect and command over her home. The 1589 tract, Jane Anger, argued that men relied on women for their basic survival. As they are comforted by our means, they are nourished by the meats we dress, their bodies freed from diseases by our cleanliness, which otherwise would surefoot unreasonably through their own noisomeness. Without our care, they lie in their beds as dogs in litter and go like lousy mackerel swimming in the heat of summer. Men confess we are necessary, but they would have us likewise evil. Why should the work of women be discounted? This woman argued, as was not the biblical Adam made of clay, which was then purified when he became flesh. Then lacking a help for him, God making woman of man's flesh, that she might be purer than he, doth evidently show how far we women are more excellent than men. From women sprang man's salvation. A woman was the first that believed, and a woman likewise the first that repented of sin. Tudor housewives would certainly argue that their lives were as important, serious and vital to the running estate as the work of any other man, be he a labourer or politician. Tudor housewives were vital to the function of their society, living lives full of hard work, true, but with expression for their passion, their talent, their sociability, their authority. 
So many of the jobs described, like baking or laundry, required the help and professional service of servants, children, or the participation of friends. These women lived in a world of widespread misogyny where they were not the equals of men. However, we should not continue these ideas by dismissing the working and social lives of women as housewives as being of no importance, of no interest, of no wider significance, because historians have historically perceived household labour as just being a thing that women do. How they did it, why they did it, and the framework in which they worked deserves study, respect, and wider consideration. Reconsider the word housewife the next time you use it. Remember the skills that these women demanded you recognise, respect and see as being more excellent than their menfolk. Their satisfaction in life was far different than my own, but they lived vibrant, fascinating, necessary lives that should not be seen as less interesting or less deserving of study than the men around them as being just housewives. Thanks for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about Tudor housewifery, if you got to the end of this video. I know it's very long, but I tried to present an average life with as much depth as I could. I used the framework from Alison Plowden's A Tudor Housewife, but a lot of the stats and stuff came from the works that I'm presenting now on screen. So if you're interested in doing some more detailed reading of the subject, I would consider these texts as being your launching off pad. If you're really interested and like what I do, consider liking, subscribing and possibly even donating some money to my coffee link. As I said during the video, I'd love to make more essays on other aspects of women's lives, especially during the Tudor period, such as more about marriage and about how child worth changed as midwives became less common, and definitely videos on queer history, as this video is kind of all about cis normative women and didn't really give me much chance to talk about how queer people lived during the 16th century. And I'd like to do more of that in the future. Bye.